Lord, we want to find ourselves aligned with your word. And this passage this morning certainly uh, gives us that opportunity to see what it is that you want to do in our lives individually and what you want to do in our life as a church. So we, uh, again, just invite and ask your spirit to be our teacher, to guide us uh, into the truth that can transform and change our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it seems that it is simply a part of the human condition. It's simply a part of human nature to tend to go to extremes. Uh, We find ourselves uh, swinging from one end of the pendulum often to the other, going from one extreme to another. Uh, Probably the easiest way to illustrate that uh, uh, right off the top is to just think in terms of a sporting event, to think of how we have a favorite sports team And one minute, uh, the crowd of thousands can be cheering wildly uh, in favor of their team. And uh, in a very quick turn of events, suddenly that same crowd of people can swing way over to the other side and be booing with just as much ferocity as the energy that they were cheering with. And just think of any area of life. Think of any topic of life. Think of anything that that, that we can, that, that seems to be the human spirit, the human condition, the human nature, to go from one extreme to another. Take uh, food and health and dieting and drink. Uh, we get confused just hearing the voices, don't we, as to what we're to do, what we're to avoid, what we are to uh, stay away from. Uh, not that many years ago, we were told, don't drink too much coffee, it's bad for you. Now we can drink all the coffee we want, it seems. Uh, Eggs there for a while were kind of the no-no, weren't they? Don't eat too many eggs. It won't be good for you. It's no protein, protein. Carbs, no carb. Fat, no fat. Sugar, no sugar. Uh, Just take your pick as to which extreme you want to find yourself uh, at, right? I mean, there was even a time where they said donuts weren't good for you, and I'm glad we've swung back the other way now. (laughs) we, We provide those here at the church. It's such a good idea. So we have all these extremes, don't we? You think in terms of uh, family life, parenting, marriage, dating. Uh, There was a time when parents actually raised their children. Now children raise their parents, it seems, in so many respects. We just, we we swing from one end of the pendulum to the other. It's in the church. It's in religious experiences. Some people at some point in their life are very much into a traditional liturgical formal. They may swing at some other point in their life and become a part of something much more casual, non-liturgical, non-traditional, and that's just a picture of human nature. Well, the Apostle Paul joins us in that uh, little snapshot because he doesn't want us to be swinging from one end of the pendulum to the other. Uh, I think he would want us to not only be uh, grounded biblically, obviously, but he'd probably want us to find ourselves somewhere in the middle of this topic that he brings before us this morning. So let's turn again to Galatians 5. And as we come to the Galatians 5 study this morning, we're going to look at just three verses, 13, 14, and 15. In fact, as we come to the midpoint of chapter 5, and we can see that chapter 6 is right there before us, these last 32 verses that are a part of the rest of Galatians We're going to slow down just a little bit because there is powerful truth in these verses, and we want to make sure that we take the time to discover uh, what the Spirit of God would have to teach us. Before we look at these verses, let's step back and do a quick review of this fifth chapter as we're about halfway through. There is in this fifth chapter uh, the, the theme of freedom and of liberty. In fact, we could argue, as we have, that that's the theme of the book of Galatians. It's about liberty. It's about freedom. And to this point, in these first 12 verses, there's really a couple of concerns. There's a couple of things that Paul has brought to our attention. And in verses 1 through 6, it's freedom and how that freedom is obtained. And he begins that first verse by saying, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we mentioned the fact that it would be a good verse to memorize. Galatians 5.1 is really the theme that captures the essence of this book. So he tells us in that opening set of six verses how it is that this freedom is obtained. He's going to touch on it again as we look at the verses before us this morning. The second thing that he does in verses 7 through 12, we saw this last week, he talks about how freedom is maintained, how this freedom is to be maintained. And he has two primary concerns in mind. 
And these two primary concerns that he has in mind, it represent two different spectrums of extremes that people go to, two ends of the pendulum to which people can swing as they try to find the balance for what it looks like to live this Christian life. One of those extremes that he deals with, especially in verses 7 through 12, you could probably argue that the first 12 verses of this chapter deal with this matter of legalism. And so oftentimes as people come to understand the doctrine of freedom in Christ, they pull back from that and they swing over into this area that we've talked about for a number of our studies, legalism. And this idea that we can put together a certain a code of behavior, that we can list out certain rules and regulations and, and, and take that code of behavior and take those rules and regulations and we can regulate and we can legislate the Christian life. And you know that as that pendulum swings over into that area of legalism and as the code of behavior is followed and as the rules of life are laid down, the, the focus is always on the external. We, we, we don't take the time when we get ensnared in legalism to pull back any of the layers and look at what's going on in the heart. It's all about what's going on in terms of what people can see. The focus is on external behavior. Work hard, follow the code, God smiles and you're a good Christian. And that's legalism. That's to swing in this pendulum away from the balance that God wants us to have as we've discovered our freedom in Christ. In response to legalism, what does human nature do? The pendulum swings over to the other side and we move away from legalism and we move into license. And when we move into license, we have a group of people who say, oh no, wait a minute. This can't possibly be what God intended. God never intended for our life to be lived in such a way that we, we have a code of, of conduct and we have a list of rules and, and all we have to do is follow these things and it's all right with the world. God never intended us to live that way and rightfully so. They say that's not where we want to be, but unfortunately they swing too far to the other side. And in their response to freedom, they say, well, we live under grace now. And I can do anything I want. I'm free to live the way that I want to. It's all forgiven. It's all under the grace of God. I can do as I please. Sometimes that is called antinomianism. Anti is the negation. It's a negative. It's against. It's no, nomos, law. Antinomianism, it's, there's no law. There's no rules. You just live any way that you want to because, after all, we have freedom in Christ. When I was growing up, in the circles that I grew up in, legalism was the greater danger. Legalism was the, the greater entrapment of those two. And it would be very easy in that kind of a setting as you went through those list of things that you were to be doing and the list that you weren't to be doing to begin to focus simply on the external outward behaviors of life and neglect what's going on in one's heart. And then along came the 60s and 70s and that went on into the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s and beyond, and, and license broke out everywhere. And Christians began to move away from the entanglements of legalism, and they began to follow after this idea that we are free, and we are free in Christ to do whatever we want, and, and, and legalism was replaced with license, and there was a lifestyle of indulgence. And before long, lots of Christians left the ideas of legalism and got sucked over into license, and their life began to look very much like the world. And in fact, a lot of Christians live in such license that you really can't distinguish them from the world. They do the things that the world does. They talk the way the world talks. They entertain themselves the way the world entertains themselves. They dress the way the world dresses. And all distinction is lost as we swing the pendulum too far the other way. So in legalism, we end up with a false spirituality. We have a false sense of spirituality. I'm following this code of conduct. God must be happy with me. After all, that is how we live the Christian life, isn't it? On the other side of it, in license, we have a false sense of freedom. And we've confused the grace of God with antinomianism. We now think we can live any way that we want. Well, Paul wants us to discover something in the middle of that. The biblical position of how it is we walk in the freedom that Christ has provided for us. And what he will say to us in these three verses is this. True Christian liberty is the freedom to serve each other in love. That's what he wants us to take away 
from verses 13, 14, and 15. Follow here as we read these verses, and then we'll look at them together. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. Here's the principle of Christian liberty set forward in these verses. And in that principle of Christian liberty, Paul begins in that first statement of verse 13 with the call to liberty. The call to liberty. Look again at the first sentence there at at the 13th verse. For you were called to freedom. Now, one thing we absolutely know for sure, that the call of God to freedom is a call that is based on the grace of God. This call that has occurred in our life is a calling that has come to us by grace. We know that because that's the repeated refrain of the New Testament, and it is especially the repeated refrain that Paul gives us in this epistle. This letter to the Galatians begins in the first chapter in verse 3 with Paul linking together grace and the peace from our God and our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he drops into verse 6, and he puts them together. I am amazed that you were so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. Verse 15, he says the same thing. But when he had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace. So this calling that has come to us is a calling that, as we have said, is, is based on grace, and it's a call to grace. He puts it in the past tense. You were called. What is he doing? He's looking back at B.C., right? He's looking back before Christ. Many of you can remember what life was like before Christ. Some of you can't. Some of you, like me, maybe were brought up in a Christian home, and the before Christ is not all that terribly clear to you as to what that life looked like. But at some point, there was a place in your life in which God came into your life, and by his grace, he called, right? And before Christ, that's what he's indicating to us here, you were called by Christ. You were called by the grace of God. The Bible talks about this matter of being called in a couple of different ways. It calls uh, one of the categories that we think of when we think of the calling of God on our life, we just simply call it the general call of God, the general calling. And you ask what? Well, what is the general calling? Well, it's a calling that's general. It's a general call. It's the call of God that goes on every time the gospel is proclaimed. Every time the gospel is is pronounced and, and, and shared, the scriptures would indicate to us this is the common grace of God. This is God allowing somebody to hear again the good news of the gospel. That's why we want to always be gospel-oriented in our life and in our language and as a church. We want to be a gospel-centered church. Why? Because we get to be a part of the general grace of God, the, the calling of God that goes out every time the gospel is shared. So as the gospel is shared with our children, there's a general call of that gospel. As it happens in student ministry, college, young singles, married couples, all the way up Every time the gospel is announced and proclaimed, there's a general call of that gospel that the truth is put before somebody. But what he's talking about here isn't the general call. He's talking here about what we would call the effectual call. Now, these aren't words that you find in the Bible. You're not going to turn to some passage and go, oh, there's the general call. Oh, there's the effectual call. But the effectual call is that call that takes place in our lives when we personally hear that gospel by means of the general call announcement, and God the Spirit sovereignly in His grace opens our eyes and opens our heart, and we understand and we, we respond to that gospel. So that's what he's saying here. You were called before you came to Christ. Before that happened, God stepped into your life, and He called you, and He called you by His grace. We, we may not have that stated in terms of effectual call, general call, but I can show you a picture of it. A beautiful picture of it in Acts chapter 13 and verse 48. Listen to what Luke says. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. That is, they heard the gospel. And as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. And as many had been called to eternal life, believed. 
There was the working of God in their lives. Chapter 16 and verse 14, there's another neat snapshot of that in the life of Lydia. And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about what happened to Lydia. He's talking about what happened in that 13th chapter. He's talking about the general call of the gospel that goes out. And then the Spirit of God takes that gospel and He opens our heart. He opens our eyes. He gives us understanding and we believe. So he says, as he's bringing them back to where he wants them to be, and he's going to bring these cautions against legalism and license, come back to the reality that you were called brethren. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you were called. And you were called, secondly, at great cost. You were called at great cost. Because he speaks in in that passage about the fact that they were called to freedom. And it's really the word freedom that you want to focus on there for a moment because if you're called to freedom, what does that indicate? It indicates that there was a time, B.C., when you weren't free, right? There was a time when you were, in fact, imprisoned. There was a time when you were in bondage. That's the spiritual language of Scripture to speak about what life was like before Christ. Before Christ, we were in bondage. Before Christ, we were imprisoned. Before Christ, we needed to be delivered. That's the whole story of redemption, isn't it? God coming and rescuing us and God coming and delivering us, God coming and freeing us from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin, ultimately one day from the presence of sin, but it is a rescue that takes place. And so now we're free. And we're free... Because Christ did everything that was necessary for us to be free. Christ did all that was necessary. And that's why he says in chapter 2 and verse 4, but it was because of the false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us back into bondage. The false teachers were bringing their false gospel and their false spirituality, and they were seeking to put them back into bondage to take away their freedom. That's why he says what he does in chapter 5 and verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. So Jesus would say in John 8, verse 32, that when you know the truth, it's when you know the truth that you become free, right? When you're introduced to the truth, when you're introduced to the gospel, that's true freedom. That's freedom like... No other freedom that you can experience. He says in verse 36 in that same passage, John 8, those who know the Son in the way that they have been called by God's grace, you know the Son, then you're free indeed. That's true freedom. And so we have this freedom, first of all, because Christ did everything that was necessary for us to enter into this freedom, to be rescued, to be delivered, to be brought out of this prison for the chains to fall off. The result of what Christ has done, we then believed, right? We believed in what that gospel proclaimed. And when that happens, we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. And this is all fundamental to understanding where Paul's going here. Because when we diminish the work of Christ, we lose the freedom that God intends for us to have. We find ourselves back in a place where we've yielded that freedom to something that isn't true. When we downplay the work of the Holy Spirit and say, you know, I can do this. Legalism takes us off into this code of conduct and this list of rules by which we regulate and legislate the Christian life, and we say, I can do this. We diminish the work of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to we don't want to diminish the work of Christ or the work of the Holy Spirit because those are essential to our growth in grace. So here's the deal. How we view freedom then informs how we use our freedom. How we view it is going to inform how we use it. And so let's look at what this looks like in this next verse. P.T. Forsyth, who was a Scottish theologian and, and preacher, made this statement. The purpose of life is not to find your freedom. The purpose of life is to find your master. I I just thought when I read that this week, yes, that's it. 
The purpose of life is not to find freedom. There's lots of people looking for freedom, but the purpose of our life is not to find freedom. The purpose of our life is to find the right master. <laughs> Remember Bob Dylan way back when made that, uh, wrote that song, Got to Serve Somebody? And that, that's, that's it. That's what he's saying. He's saying you're going to serve somebody, so find the right master. And when you find the right master, you find freedom in a way that you've never found it before. And that's why Paul offers now, secondly, this word of caution. So let's look from the call to liberty. Let's look at the misuse of liberty. And you see that in the next statement of the 13th verse and and also in the 15th verse. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Verse 15. But if you take... But, but, if you, but if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. So here is the caution. The caution that Paul offers is don't let your liberty be turned into license. Don't be one of those people who's swinging on this pendulum back and forth. You eschew legalism so you, you move so far over that now you find yourself caught up in the spirit of, of license. And he gives another caution with that. And that caution is don't allow your license to be used for self-indulgence. Not for self-indulgence. That's the point of that 13th verse. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. The word opportunity is a military word. And it speaks of a, of a military uh, using a base as a place of sending out forces for engaging in combat. And so it's a very picturesque word that Paul uses here. He says there, that you, can, you can misuse your liberty to such a point that you allow that liberty to be taken over by the flesh in such a way that the opportunity is given to the flesh to go out and engage in sinful behavior. The flesh that he speaks of here is obviously not the flesh of our our, our body. It's not, it's not flesh and blood. Now, it can, it can manifest itself in that way, but, but he's talking about flesh in a different way. He's talking about flesh from the standpoint of sinful habits. He's talking about don't, don't let your liberty become license for sinful desires and sinful habits. What does the flesh represent in our life? The flesh represents in our life uh, our wanting to do what we want to do. The flesh represents our wanting to do what we want to do, irrespective of what God wants us to do. (laughs) The flesh is what uh, says, I want to do it my way, whether God wants me to do it that way or not. And he's warning us here, don't yield to self-indulgence. Don't let your liberty in Christ, this freedom that, that Christ has died to give to you, don't let that liberty then become an operating base for the flesh to live life in such a way that the flesh just says, I can do as I please. I live under grace. If I do something, I know God's going to forgive me. So I just live in grace, and I live the way I want to. I live the way I please. Paul says, don't do that. Here's a very specific caution uh, against allowing our liberty to become license for self-centeredness and selfishness and sinful desires. It's described very clearly, as we're going to see in a couple of weeks in verse 19. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are under, you're not under the law, verse 18. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are these. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, there's a pretty graphic picture of liberty gone bad, right? Of liberty that's been turned into license, of giving freedom to the flesh to just do whatever you please, live the way you want to. It's my choice. One of the things that this self-indulgent flesh wants to do is the second caution that Paul gives. And that second caution is don't use your liberty, don't give license to liberty to then, secondly, exploit other people. 
So don't allow the flesh to have a base of operation to become involved in sinful indulgence. Don't allow the flesh to have a base of operation to exploit other people. That's what he says in verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. So here you have liberty, and you can have legalism do the same thing, that without love leads to mutual destruction. Legalism without love leads to mutual destruction. That's what we looked at last week in part, was what, is, what, is the, what does legalism look like oftentimes in a church? What does it oftentimes look like in an individual's life? It's narrow, it's constricting, it's joyless, it's, it's confining. It's all of those things that we don't want. In fact, Robert Louis Stevenson once wrote in his diary, I went to church today and didn't get depressed. (laughs) And he was just reflecting on the fact that his common experience was to go to church and get depressed. He goes, why? Because it was a legalistic code that he knew he couldn't keep, but it was crushing him. He came to realize that's not what God called him to. Chesterton said he might have become a minister, except most ministers he knew looked and acted like undertakers. And so he didn't want to do that either. Well, that, what, what is that? That's legalism that's dominated by the flesh, which it always is, and demonstrates itself in, in loveless behavior. Well, the same thing can happen with license and with liberty gone bad. It can go to the other extreme, and it also will manifest itself in mutual destruction. There's a real tragic description of this verse, verse 15. This is a self-centered, self-indulgent life. And apparently this is what was happening in Galatia as, as word came back to Paul about what was going on in the life of the church. What's described in that 15th verse is, is something that nobody would want to be a part of. It makes its way into a lot of churches yet today, though, doesn't it? Verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. That's an apt description of a lot of churches who find themselves either ensnared in legalism and have a loveless, joyless type of life and lifestyle within the body life, or it's a picture of license that is also devoid of love, and it's a picture of mutual destruction. I read recently of a church that was in the midst of a major knockdown dragout drag-out about which version of the Bible to use. We do tend to pick the wrong things to fight and devour each other over, don't we? Which version of the Bible to use? How many churches' testimonies have been uh, nullified as they fight over which version of the Bible to use? And, And so the pastor rightfully stood and he said to his people, whichever version you desire to use, you need to understand that God has not told us which version we're supposed to use. After all, there were hundreds of years of church history before some of the most favorite versions were ever around. And the church functioned and went along until those versions were written and created, right? And so he said, whatever version you want to use, understand God has not told us in the Bible which version we're to use. But it's my observation that whichever version you have, we're not reading that Bible. And that was his point. And he could very easily have gone to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15. And it happens often in churches that we end up fighting over things we should never be fighting over. But it is what? It's a picture of license that is devoid of love, that becomes self-destructive in its behavior towards each other. And by the way, devouring one another is not one of the one another commands of the New Testament, is it? Devouring one another. In fact, uh, I think it's rather uh, insightful. Ray Ortland Jr. has uh, made this comment about the one another commands of the New Testament. He says it can be helpful for us to see what isn't in the New Testament. There are a number of one another's that I can't find. I can't find humble one another, scrutinize one another, pressure one another, embarrass one another corner one another, interrupt one another, defeat one another, disapprove of one another, run one another's lives, confess one another's sins, 
intensify one another's sufferings, point out one another's failings. In a soft environment where we settle for a false peace with present evils, we turn on one another. In a realistic environment where we are suffering to advance the gospel, our thoughts turn to how we stick up for one another. So there's a lot of one another's in the New Testament. And then there are a lot of one another's that we've added to the New Testament because we exercise those in each other's lives with regularity. Well, where Paul goes next, he gives us the call of liberty. You were called by God's grace because of what Christ has done. You've been giving the indwelling Holy Spirit. But you can misuse that liberty. You can misuse that calling. You can allow it to spin off in your life and become a, a behavior of self-indulgence. And you can live as if this life is just all about you. Or you can also spin off in that and you can become very uh, harmful towards each other and you can exploit each other if you don't exercise this liberty in the way God designed. So then at the end of verse 13 and verse 14, he brings us back and he says, now let me show you where this middle biblical ground is. You swing the pendulum over here to legalism and you swing it back over here to license and here's where you need to be because the purpose of liberty is given to us at the end of verse 13 and into verse 14. And let's look at that, what he says there. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what is the purpose of liberty? For what purpose has Christ set us free? For what purpose has Christ set us free and said to us, don't give up this liberty, don't go back, don't misuse it, but do what with it? Well, the first thing he says is use it to serve each other. Serve others. Now, this is a rather amazing turn of events, especially if you would not be familiar with the New Testament and know the story that unfolds in the life of our Lord. But here we have Paul talking about being freed from bondage, right? We've been liberated. We were imprisoned. And Christ came and He liberated us. He came and He freed us. He came and He rescued us. And Paul will go all the way through this cycle and he'll come back to the true purpose of liberty and he'll use the word, you've been liberated to serve each other. And the word serve is the word form from doulos, which is a word that was commonly used of the lowest level of slave that there was. It's amazing, isn't it? He takes us right back to, to, to slavery. He takes us right back to servitude. He, in effect, says to us, you've been set free, so in one sense that you can now be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That's a very familiar New Testament expression, isn't it? Paul uses that often to start off an epistle. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. I, Paul, writing to you, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. James does it. Peter does it. Jude does it. As they begin their letters, they say to those they're writing to, hey, by the way, this is Paul. This is Peter. This is James. This is Jude. I'm an apostle, in some cases they would say, but I'm also a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I'm a bondservant. I'm a doulos. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. We have been set free for the very purpose of serving one another. Now, I think for a lot of us, we may not only be surprised, we may become taken back by that. We might be repulsed by that. We don't like that idea. <laughs> we like the idea of freedom. We like the idea of liberty. But to what end? Well, it's not supposed to be for self-indulgence. It's not supposed to be to give an opportunity to the flesh. We haven't been liberated and freed so that we can exploit each other. The very purpose for which we have been called by Christ to liberty, Paul says, is that we would serve each other to the extent that we may be surprised by that, to the extent that we may be repelled by that. We've missed 
the fundamental teaching of the life of our Lord, haven't we? For it was with Jesus Himself, of whom the Scriptures say, Mark 10, that He did not come to have people serve Him as the Son of God, but He came to serve people and to give His life as a ransom for many. So that Paul would say in Philippians 2 that he humbled himself. Yes, he humbled himself and he became a servant. When he had every right to declare who he was and to demand that people serve him, he came and showed us a different way that through liberty in Christ we might serve each other. And on the last night that he was with his disciples, before he shared in that beautiful ceremony with them around the table, what does he do? He gets the basin of water and a towel, and he goes around the room and he washes these dirty, stinky feet of these disciples. There's no other picture that you can draw from the life of our Lord and from the instruction of the New Testament than the fact that we have been called as a people We have been called to serve each other. You want to be free? You want to know what freedom is? Then get outside of yourself. Get over yourself. Because that's the only way you'll ever find freedom. You'll never find freedom wrapped up in that little package called self. (laughs) You'll never find freedom wrapped up in that little package called me or I. The only way that we come to know freedom is to understand that we are called to a life of service. That's true freedom. We live in a world of takers. And it's very easy for us to become just like the world in that way and to live a life of being a taker. The other companion of freedom to serve is what? To serve in love. The other companion, the other purpose of this freedom, God's called us to serve And then he tells us how it is that we're to do that. We're we're to to serve each other in love, it says at the end of that verse. You shall love, uh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The two go together, don't they? This is the paradox of the Christian life. Through love, be a servant of one another. You go back to verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not subject yourself again to the yoke of slavery. You were called to freedom. You were called to a freedom that allows you to be a servant. And in that service, we submit to each other in love and we serve each other in love. Now, let me ask you a question. Why is love which serves others the only way to true freedom? Why why is love which serves others the only way to true freedom? Why, Why is the call to freedom and the call to love synonymous? Why is the call to freedom and the call to love just just one and the same thing? People think they can be free another way, and they pursue that freedom in all kinds of ways, don't they? We call it it the flesh. Sadly, this is the beginning of spring break. And you know what spring break means in the minds of millions of students, high school on up to college and, and beyond? It means one thing. It means the pursuit of freedom. And the pursuit of freedom in that definition, in that limited worldview, is let's go to the beach and let's get drunk, let's get stoned, let's involve ourselves in every sexual fantasy that we can imagine, and that's freedom. And the Bible says, that's not freedom. You've exchanged one set of chains for another. You've just moved from one imprisonment to another. And sadly, uh, there's, there's a lot of heartache that goes with that experience, isn't there? But boy, is it looked forward to. Paul says you live according to the flesh and you just simply exchange one form of slavery for another. You live according to the Spirit and you serve each other in love and you find true freedom. 
Because here's why. There's no more fulfilling way than to live your life drawing on the power of God and the fullness of God and allowing that power and that fullness and that love to spill over out of your life to other people. And and there's nothing emptier. There's nothing that will suck other people dry than to have a person who's living life for themselves, who's occupied with self, who's consumed with self, Because what that person is doing is they're sucking in all of the life from everybody else to try to fulfill what only God says can be realized through the gospel. So out of their emptiness, they seek this freedom. They seek this liberty that isn't freedom and liberty at all. It's just another form of slavery. It's another form of bondage. But you and I, filled with God's Spirit and response to the gospel and the life of Christ flowing out of us, out of this fullness, we can love and serve each other in a way that we never can apart from the gospel and having been called and experiencing God's grace. The flesh operates out of emptiness, but the Spirit of God within us offers us a fullness that overflows. That's why Jesus says in John 13, 35, how is it that people are going to know we're any different than anybody else? And he didn't list off what version we carry around of the Bible. And he didn't list off a hundred other things that Christians normally list off. He said, you know how they're going to know? They're going to know because you guys love each other. They're going to know because you guys serve each other. They're going to know because you serve each other in love. That's how they're going to know that there's something different here. That's what makes one place attractive and another place not so much because they're serving each other in love. That's why in that 14th verse, you notice again, what does he say? For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why didn't Jesus begin with the first command? When that rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. What does Paul do? Paul doesn't pick out the first commandment. Paul says when we love each other, when we serve each other, in verse 14 he says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Shouldn't he have put you shall love God first? Why does he say love your neighbor first? Because of what Jesus said in John 13, 35. The most obvious way that the world knows that you and I love God is because they witness how we love each other. And one of the greatest turnoffs to Christianity throughout the history of the church has been the inability of Christians to love and serve each other in a way that demonstrates that we got any idea of what's going on in this book and in the gospel, and we end up doing what? Verse 15, we bite, devour one another, take care lest we be consumed. It's called spiritual cannibalism. And it ought to be the prayer of our heart every time we have an opportunity to pray, God, don't allow the spirit of cannibalism in Covenant Community Church. Allow the Spirit of God to breathe on us in such a way and to breathe out the gospel in such a way that it is radically evident that this is a people, a group of people that I'd like to be a part of, that I feel welcomed into. The New Testament is filled with one another commands. And they're not the one another commands that Ortland referenced, are they? They're the one another commands of serve one another, love one another, bear up one another's burdens, build up one another, admonish one another, forgive one another, comfort one another, pray for one another, confess, teach, greet, spur on, accept, encourage, prefer, be devoted, kind, submit, and others. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. This is what God wants to do in the life of Covenant Community Church. This is what should be our prayer for this church. I'm reading a book on intentional discipleship, and in that book, this author says one of the questions that he asks pastors everywhere he goes is, what do you want to see in your church a year from now? What do you want to see in your church two years from now? And he said he can almost universally know that the answer that they give is going to go into one bucket, and that one bucket is going to be more people. 
in some way or another, the bucket always gets filled up with more people. Now, we all want more people to be affected and touched by the gospel, and we all want more people to experience the life of Christ and the transformation that comes from the gospel and be a part of a loving community. We all want more people. But his comment in the book is, why aren't more pastors saying what I want for my church in a year from now, in two years from now, is that there be a greater evidence of a loving spirit of service to each other? You know, why, don't we, why don't we have those kinds of things rather than just saying, oh, I'd like to have this place filled every Sunday? Well, you know, maybe what God wants to do is say, let's get the basics down of loving and serving each other and let me take care of that. Because that's what Paul says here about true Christian liberty. True Christian liberty is the freedom to serve each other in love. Now, what do you take away from these verses? This is what I take away. I say take this principle that we just enunciated. True Christian liberty is the freedom to serve and love each other and take that into your home. Take that principle into your home. And and you young people and children, you begin to relate to your mom and dad in a way that is serving them in love. And parents, you begin to relate to your children in a way that you're serving them in love. That's true Christian liberty. True Christian liberty is submitting yourselves one to another. It's loving and serving each other. Take this principle into your marriage, men. Take this principle of loving and serving your wife into your marriage and see what happens in your marriage relationship. Wives, have this attitude towards your husband that as you love and serve them, see what happens in your marriage. You don't think that would be transformative? You don't think that would change the the atmosphere, the temperature of our homes? Take this attitude into the workplace. You're kidding me. No, I'm not. This is New Testament living. It's not just confined to what goes on in these four walls. You take the service and and the love of Christ out into the workplace. And you see how it is that you can love and serve others within the place of work that God has put you, within that school that you're in, within that place of recreation that God affords you. That's That's what this is saying to us. Take this attitude wherever you go. Take this spirit wherever you go, and you and I will be changed by this because that's what God wants to do. That's the transforming nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God filling us with the fullness of God so that out of that fullness, we can then share that with others. It is as self dominates our life that our life is empty And then all you hear is this great sucking sound of somebody trying to fill their life with what God never intended their life to be filled with. Because what he intended was for us to be filled by the Spirit, by the gospel of his grace, to flow out to each other in loving service. Let's pray. That 13th verse started off and it said, you were called. And if you've never experienced that calling this morning, if you've never understood that the gospel of God's grace is found in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again so that the penalty of our sin would be paid once and for all forever. And and that God's not looking to you to work your way to heaven. He's not looking for you to earn your way to heaven. He's not looking for you to check off in the box what it is that you've done for him again in that day. He's looking for you to respond in faith to what he has said about his son, that what Jesus did was all that needed to be done for our sins to be forgiven and for God to give us the gift of eternal life. And that's the offer that God gives to each one of us here this morning that we can leave knowing our sins are forgiven and we can leave here this morning knowing that we will spend eternity with him forever because he's given us the gift of eternal life. Father God, we ask that by your spirit, this general call will become very specific and very effectual this morning in the heart of someone that is here that needs to be delivered and rescued from sin and death and darkness, as all of us do, 
And they will, in simple faith, put their trust in what Jesus has done for them. And Father, we pray that by your Spirit you will also infect every one of us with this heart and this desire to love and serve each other in such a way that there is an outpouring of your grace and of your Spirit in this place like we've never seen before and that there is an attractiveness and a winsomeness to this body of believers that says to the world they know they know the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask that, we believe you for that, Father, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.